concept of the splitting of the sea and ultimately the song of the sea. So we began to talk about it a little bit yesterday, but we didn't get into really the Kabbalistic angle. So that's what we're gonna hope to focus on today. So just a few introductions that are in place. So one important um, point that Hasidic philosophy focuses on based on the commentaries of the Torah is that if you look at the map of the Middle East, um, you see that the Jewish people did not have to cross the, the uh, Red Sea. In other words, to get to Sinai from where they were, crossing it, they didn't have to cross the Red Sea. In fact, according to um, many commentators, according to Tysus in particular, they actually didn't cross the sea. You may have heard that we crossed the sea, but it's not really what happened. Um, what happened is we entered the sea and then we left the sea on the same side. So it's almost like a half a circle. So we made a U instead of crossing the sea. And that's why we don't really call it the crossing of the sea. We call it the splitting of the sea because in some sense, we didn't really cross the sea. So this begs the question, if indeed we didn't cross the sea, then why everything has to, everything everything is significant so if god wants to punish the egyptians there could have been another form if that was the whole purpose to cross the sea is to get rid of the egyptians who are pursuing the jews there could have been another, another form of punishment why specifically the splitting of the sea so this leads the kabbalists to explain the splitting of the sea is actually um, in addition to the practical side is it's actually a spiritual process and not only is it a spiritual process, but it's a spiritual process that is critical in order for us to receive the Torah. So in other words, you, it is really part of, if we have to get to the sea and we have to, the sea has to split and we have to enter the sea in order for us to be prepared spiritually to receive the Torah. And therefore, once we establish that the splitting of the sea is not only a um, a way to get rid of the Egyptians, but it's also a process, a spiritual process. So therefore, in our prayers, we also mention the splitting of the sea every day. And in fact, we recite the song of the crossing of the sea every single day, because if it is true on a national level, on a historical level, that we cannot get the Torah until we cross the sea, then in some sense, we have to recreate that experience within our own life every day. So now we have our work cut out for ourselves. What is the sea? What is the splitting of the sea? And what does it mean that we have to recreate those that, that experience every day? Now, for those who have been here before, some of this we explain every year because the basic concept of the splitting of the sea we discussed in the past. So I'm going to repeat that, but we also have some new stuff. In other words, a new angle that um, we have not discussed in the past. So if you hear me talking and you say, oh, I heard this last year, then hang in there and uh, we'll get some new stuff as well. We have to start with the basics so we can't skip. So from the Kabbalistic perspective, what is the idea of a sea, splitting of the sea? So before you get to the splitting of the sea, you have to figure out what is what does the sea represent? And from a Kabbalistic perspective, you would, the Kabbalah explains, and that's really based on many, sorry, sorry. many other uh, areas within Judaism indicate this concept, that you will see that um, the water, the sea, is associated with purification, right? So you see the concept of, for example, the best example is the mikvah. What is the mikvah? Mikvah is a body of water. You submerge in the water. It's almost like the sea. And that brings about purity. And there are other indications that water represents the concept of purity and spirituality. So let's think about this for, this, for a second. Um, what's the difference between the creations of the sea and the creations on the dry land? There's an interesting piece of Talmud. The Talmud says, Kol any creature, that is created, on, that, that, that exists on the dry land, also exists in the water. In other words, there's an equivalent creature both in the water and to the creature that is on the dry land. 
And the difference between the creatures in the dry land and the creatures in the sea, at least from our perspective, is that in the sea, the creation, the creature, the individual creature is submerged within the water. And therefore, that creation does not appear to be separate and distinct from its source. In fact, from our perspective, when we look at the sea, we don't see an individual creation. We see just the source, the source of life. What's the source of life for the creatures of the sea? It's the water. So in other words, um, when we look at the sea, what are we seeing? We're seeing a reality that has tremendous amount of diversity, tremendous amount of life, to the extent that we don't even, we, we have not yet explored even a small part of the sea. I think they say maybe 95% of the sea is, has not yet been explored. So we're going to Mars, but we have not yet seen uh, all the secrets with all, the, all, the, all life forms within the sea. So the sea represents what the Kabbalah calls the world of concealment. What does the world of concealment mean? If I lived in the world of concealment, then I am in a space where I don't sense myself. I just sense the water. I just sense the source of God that creates me. So I don't feel myself as an individual creation. I feel myself as part of the unifying energy of God. That's the creation of the sea. What is the creation of the dry land? Dry land, I'm also dependent on my source of life for survival. So if we're creatures of the dry land, we need the land. We cannot live without the land. We need food from the land. And ultimately, ultimately we need the land to survive. However, even though I need the land to survive, we're not hopefully submerged within the land. Hopefully we're walking above the land. Only when we die are we placed back covered in the source of our life. So you have, you have an interesting phenomenon. In what the Kabbalah calls the revealed world, I feel myself separate and apart from my spiritual source. And therefore, as a result, every creation within the revealed world appears to be separate and distinct. So I don't necessarily feel myself as part of you because you're you, I'm me. Yes, we have one source. We're all, we all eat from the earth and we all have to survive from the earth. But I see myself as distinct. So of course, we, we're also, we, we, we have, we, we're in the atmosphere. We have, we're, we're submerged and covered with, uh, with, uh, with, 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 uh, with oxygen, with air. But the point is, that's true. But we don't see it. It's transparent. And when I see myself, I see myself as an, as an existence that is, complete, that is completely independent from my source, not completely, but my existence is independent, does not have to be submerged within the source of my creation. That's point number one. And as a result, every creation within the revealed worlds, the creatures of the sea, the creatures of the dry land are separate and distinct. Okay, that's the dry land. What happens when you go into the sea? The sea would be the world where I don't sense myself as separate and apart from my source of life. I don't even feel myself. I feel that the energy that creates me, that's, the, that, that's what I feel. That's what I sense. And as a result, because I don't feel myself, I also don't feel your, you as a distinct entity. We're all one because that same oneness that pervades me pervades you as well. And that is the psyche of the fish. Now, again, I don't know if the fish feels this way. I never spoke to a fish. But the point here is the metaphor. When we look at the sea, that's the type of reality that we see. When we look at the sea, that's a type of reality that we're sensing from our perspective. So says the Kabbalah that everything in this world is just really a metaphor for, 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 for spirituality. So in the spiritual sense, we also have these two phenomena. There is the spiritual world of concealment, the spiritual world of the sea. And then there's the spiritual world of the dry land. And if I were to live in the spiritual world of the sea, Amadit Kasia, what the Zohar says, the concealed worlds. If I'm an angel in heaven, I don't, number one, I don't sense myself. I sense the, the, the energy of God that creates me. I feel like I'm completely submerged within the light of God for survival. And that's why, what do the angels do all day? All they do is praise God. Why? Because they don't sense their own needs. What do they sense? They sense the water. They sense the source of life that gives them life. And they realize that if they're disconnected from the water, they're dead. It's like taking a fish out of water. So what do they do in the morning? The angel gets up and says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, which means all it does is it feels, it's a spiritual entity that feels either love or, or compassion, depending on the type of angel. But all it does is it feels the presence of God. 
And that's one spiritual entity. And then you have a different spiritual entity. That's our, that's our worlds. What's our worlds? The lower worlds is the worlds of revelation. Amadit Galya, the world of, of revelation. What does the world of revelation mean? Not that God is revealed. God is not revealed here. It's God is more concealed. But we are revealed. Our independent existence in our mind, we, feel, we sense ourselves. Now, which one is true? Are we independent or not? It doesn't matter which one is true. It's the perspective. When you live in this world, when you live in the world of revelation, you sense yourself as significant. And from your perspective, that's true. Yes, of course, you're also existing within the all-pervading existence of God. That's like we too, we have that uh, oxygen and atmosphere that we cannot live without. Yeah, but that's true, but we don't sense it. We don't feel it until God forbid you can't breathe. You don't, you, you don't realize that you're dependent on something outside yourself. The moment God forbid you can't breathe, all of a sudden you realize how dependent you are on what's outside of you. So, but in our psyche, we're fine. We're independent. We don't, we're not dependent on our source. So that's the revealed world. That's the revealed world. And now I'll give it to you right here. It says the Kabbalah. What happens at the splitting of the sea? Now, the splitting of the sea, even according to the Medrash, before you get to Kabbalah, and the Talmud, the splitting of the sea is a moment of great divine revelation. Um, one of the things that the Jewish people say when they, in the song, early in the song, they say, Ze Eli van vehu. this is my God and I will beautify him. Right? That's the famous book, from Herman Walk, This is My God. It's a direct quote from the song of the splitting of the sea. Ze Eli, this is my God. So what does the Talmud say about this is my God? This is my God. In Hebrew, Zeh, maybe in English as well, but certainly in Hebrew, the word Zeh, the word this is first person, which means if I'm saying this, the Talmud says, Mara zeh. I could have to be able to point at something to be able to say Zeh. So if you're saying this is my God, it means it's first person, it's before you, it's not concealed, it's revealed. It's almost as if you could point. Figuratively speaking, you sense God's presence to the point where you could point at it. So what the Jewish people say is this, this is my God. It means that at the splitting of the sea, not only do the Egyptians drown, not only are they saved from their physical oppressor, but there's a great revelation. And that's why the Talmud says that even a maidservant at the sea saw greater prophetic revelation than the prophet Yechezkel and the prophet Ezekiel, one of the greatest prophets. Great prophet Ezekiel sees the divine chariots. That is certainly, uh, sees a tremendous amount of divine revelation. We say even a maidservant at the sea sees more prof or, um, 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 prophecy than, Yeche than the prophet Yechezkel. That's what the Talmud says before you get to the Kabbalah. So what happens? Splitting of the sea. At this miracle, there was a great revelation of God. People sense prophecy. People sense the presence of God. So I ask you, why did it happen at the splitting of the sea? Why didn't it happen in Egypt? Why did it, why didn't it not happen at the 10 plagues? Why didn't it happen when they ate their, their, their Passover sandwich back in Egypt? So according to the Kabbalah, it makes sense because what is prophecy? Prophecy is sensing that, that, that which is beyond us, the presence of God. And the splitting of the sea represents that the opening up of the world of concealment. The world of concealment is usually separate and apart from our psyche. But that the splitting of the sea, it means that we enter the sea. In, our, in other words, our perception, the way we are physical beings, which usually see ourselves as separate and independent from the pervading oneness of Hashem. When we enter the sea, that's what that means is that we now feel. We now feel the experience of the sea. We feel the oneness that we're connected to. And therefore, that's as a result of that, we get the prophecy. So that is what, that's the basic concept of the splitting of the sea, according to uh, the Kabbalah. And now we're going to add some, uh, some, some details and some exciting details, but this is, this, this, is, this, this is the big idea. Now, which explains a few things. First of all, it explains why um, mikvah is the idea of purity. What is pure? What, what happens when I go to the mikvah? When I go to the mikvah, I'm completely submerged in water. Kabbalistically speaking, what does that mean? I have to be completely submerged in my source. I have to feel like I'm not something distinct from the oneness of God that pervades all around me. If I can sense that, that's purity. 
right? So according to the Kabbalah, according to the law, even if a person has one limb outside of the mikvah, I'm completely covered, just my pinky is out. I'm completely covered, just my piece, my, a strand of hair is out. Oh no, that's not purity, right? So that's the law. You have to be completely submerged. Why? Because that's the idea. The idea is, can I go back to the psyche of the world of concealment where I don't sense myself at all? And that's the, and that's the source of purity. Then I come back to the dry land. I, of course, I have to sense myself. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, it also explains something very interesting about Moshe. So what do we know about Moshe, Moses? So first of all, we know his name. Why, why, was, it, why was he called Moshe? So the, the, the verse says, the daughter of Pharaoh says, I'm calling him Moshe, because I drew him from the water. Okay, so do I ask you, you were, you were born in a hospital. So I'm going to call you the name of the hospital you were born in. In other words, you came from the hospital. So therefore what? Therefore, we're going to name you. That's your name, right? You came from the water. So what? doesn't matter where you came. It matters who you are. So Kabbalistically, when we say Moshe was drawn from the water, what we're really saying is Moshe, the way he lives in this world, he is still in the psyche of the concealed worlds. He is still spiritually in the water. He has the humility. He doesn't sense himself. He sense the presence of God. And that's why his name is Moshe. Moshe is even the way he is on the dry land. He's really a creature of the water. He's not really a creature of dry land. And that's why if you look at Moshe, what do we know about Moshe? Number one, we know he's the humblest of men. Why is he so humble? He doesn't sense himself. Another interesting detail we see about Moshe is that Moshe cannot speak. He says, um, God says, go, go to Pharaoh, speak to Pharaoh. He says, Lo ish I'm not a man of words, not today, not from yesterday, not from the day before. I don't do speech. What does it mean I don't do speech? So you could say, well, he had a speech impediment. He stuttered or whatever else he had. Maybe he had that in the physical sense. But according to the Kabbalah, everything is really a reflection of the spiritual. Every physical phenomenon is a, is a reflection of the spiritual. So when you say a mad person can't speak, what does that mean? Is it a weakness or is it a strength? Well, it depends in which realm you're work, working in. If you're working in the revealed worlds, you sense yourself, you have to be able to communicate. But if you don't sense yourself, what are you going to talk about? Talking is about, I assert myself, this is who I am, this is what I think, and this is, what I, this is how I'm going to speak. But Moshe is not in a place of revelation, and words are revelation. Because Moshe is a creature of the sea, he never feels himself. He keeps saying in the Torah, every time there's a challenge to Moshe, he says, the people challenge him, he says, what do you want from us? We're nothing. That's, what, that's, that's Moshe's psyche. Moshe is from the water. Now, a very interesting detail is essentially everybody, every, each person in this world also originates in the water. In other words, we too have both perspectives. We have the perspective, our subconscious soul. In other words, we began as creatures of the water. We began, our soul, our psyche begins in a place where we don't sense ourselves. All we sense is the pervading oneness of God. But then, we're brought into this world. What does it mean to be brought into this world? It means now we develop a sense of self. Now we're on the dry land. Now we develop a sense of independence. And that's very important to have. But it's also very important to be able to go back and forth between these two dimensions, between those sta these two states of being. And that's what the Kabbalah is going to say. The Kabbalah is going to say that every day when we pray, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to feel what the soul feels, what the subconscious soul feels. We're trying to get to the space of the sea, where the sea splits open, and we too can sense the sense of the pervading oneness of the water. And that's why we too, that's what it means that every day we're supposed to remember and commemorate the splitting of the sea. It's every day can we tap into the part of our soul, our subconscious soul, where we don't feel ourselves. And then we have to get back onto the dry land, as we discussed yesterday, but that's another story. So just to, just to, just to elaborate a little bit on this point before we, just to, just to highlight a little bit, is um, if, you wanna, if, you, if you want to, a metaphor, for not a metaphor, another application of this, is every person, psychology teaches today that every person has two very important needs, and they seem um, opposite, and they are opposite, but even though they're opposite, we still need both. And what are those two needs? We need to feel a sense of attachment. And we also need to feel a sense of independence. I have to be able to feel myself, what I need, what I want, my aspirations. 
And that's very important and that's, everyone understands that. But a deeper need that people now realize that we have is I need to sense that I'm part of something greater than self. And that's why people seek relationships. What is a relationship? A relationship is I want to lose myself within something greater than myself within this relationship. Now, the danger is, is I drown in the sea. I lose myself completely. And it's not about me. It's about you. So that's the balance. We have two needs. We have the need to be in the sea. I don't want to feel myself. I, don't want, I want to transcend my own need. I want to connect to something greater than self, either to God in, in, or in a metaphor of a relationship to somebody else. But on the other hand, simultaneously, I also have to be able to sense that my own personal unique needs are being met. And that's the sense of the dry land. So are we creatures of the sea or are we creatures of the dry land? The answer, of course, is both. In the subconscious, we're creatures of the, dry, of the sea. In the conscious mind, we are creatures of the dry land. Therefore, what do we need? We need both. We need a sense of attachment, a sense of um, um, uniting with something outside of ourselves. On the other hand, we need a sense of, of feeling the self. And if you have one without the other, you're going to suffocate because the fish would manage in the sea. And the person, in other words, the fish is happy to be part of something greater than self. The human being or the animal, the mammal, is happy to be on the dry land, happy to be separate and independent. The problem with the human spirit is we're both. We're, we have both. we're both creatures of the sea and creatures of the dry land. So both these needs have to be met. And that's what we're saying. Every day in prayer, what I want to do, I want to retreat to the space of the soul where I don't sense myself. I sense myself as part of the creature of the sea, Power an extension of the all uh, pervasive oneness of Hashem. Then I have to go back to work and I have to come back to life and I have to go eat breakfast. And that's connecting that feeling to myself in the way I sense myself in the revealed world. So I'm not a fish, I'm a human being. I walk on the earth. But that splitting of the sea is being able to tap in to that experience as well, to that experience of the subconscious soul. So this is by way of introduction. This is what we say every year. So now, if anybody has any points or comments, please share, and then we move on to the concept of song and why song is so critical for this, for this, for this process. In the meantime, Mechayim. It's not vodka, it's water. Okay. So, so is this where we, where we say uh, sing, um, Az Yashir, or that's what so it's we're called? We're saying Az Yashir, we're, sp we're singing the song of the sea. We'll talk about that later. But even, but independent of that, in the blessings of the Shema, after we say the Shema, so the third paragraph of the Shema is about the tzitzit, but the third paragraph of the Shema concludes with the mention of the Exodus, right? Ani Hashem I'm the Lord your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt to be a God for you. So and that we say that both in the morning and at night to commemorate the mitzvah, to fulfill the mitzvah of commemorating the, ex the, the Exodus. But then after that, there's another whole long blessing which is called the blessing after the Shema. And in that blessing, what we talk about, we talk about, um, we talk, we mention the, 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 um, we mention the splitting of a sea many times. And the conclusion of that blessing is Shira Hadasha Shimcha a new song, those who were redeemed uh, sang to you at the, at, the, at, the, at the seashore. So that entire blessing commemorates and mentions the splitting of the sea. And ultimately, the bless and, and, and the Kshira Chadasha, many people know that prayer, that also talks about the song that we sing. In addition to that, we actually, that was earlier. In other words, that's part of the blessings of the Shema written by the men of the Great Assembly 2,500 years ago by Ezra. Later, it became a custom that we also actually sing the song. So we also sing the song earlier before the blessings of the Shema. But it's actually part of the blessings of the Shema, so it really goes back a long time. This dynamic between earth and, and sea, once we leave the amniotic sac, oh. are, we, are we to assume that amphibians are truly the highest uh, life form then? So first of all, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. I think it has to do also with uh, your line of work. But what's the metaphor of being in the womb? What's the metaphor? The metaphor is that in the womb, we're sort of surrounded with water. Okay, That's the metaphor that it, we begin. we begin as creatures of the sea. Now you say, now we're born. Oh, so now we live on an island. We live in Manhattan. We don't live at the sea. Yes, but what happens when people go and look at the sea? At any body of water, there's a certain tranquility 
that rests upon you. I remember the first time I went to the Niagara Falls, I would have stood there for, for hours. You couldn't get your eyes off it. But it's really the, it's really the beach. It's really, it's really the ocean. Human beings have a fascination with the water. It's not just a fascination. There is a certain calmness that people sense at the water. So what, what, what is the interpretation? Kabbalistically speaking, is because we're at ease. Why are we at ease? Because we don't have to feel ourselves as an independent existence. There's the burden of existing. And that we carry with us every day of the year. But when you go back to the sea, you're going back to the womb. And you're going back to the womb, who's the mother? The mother is, the, is, is, is God giving you life. So when you go back to that space, even when you go for a moment, you're taking a walk on the, next, the, next, the, next to Todd's point. At Todd's point, next to the Long Island Sound, which is not a sea, but at least it's a make-believe. No, I'm kidding. But really, any body of water, what that does to you psychologically, it puts you in a space where you say, ah, I remember this feeling. This is a good feeling. I don't sense myself. I, se I sense the, the all-pervading oneness of the water. Great response. But you also feel that with the mountains, with the sky, with space. It's a little bit different. I mean, it's something it's greater than we. Okay, so so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disagree with you. I'm not I'm not gonna argue that it's only sent you only sense it by the water. But I think by the mountain you really need a tall mountain. Water, there's something about water. So it's true. It's true. Really, it's, again, I'm gonna make now. Let, let me let me let me let me clarify. It's true that we too are also even creatures of the of the dry land are also completely submerged in our source of life. We also need the atmosphere. We need oxygen. But in point is, in our psyche, we don't sense it. We don't feel that way. So I think you could see it in nature in general. If you have, if you have a sensitive soul, then every time you look at nature, you can be overwhelmed. But for that, you have to be that. But that, what, what, what happened there is you split your seat. If you could lose yourself looking at a flower the way people would lose themselves looking at the ocean, that means you split your seat. We discussed that yesterday. On the dry land, you have the perspective of the sea. So I agree. I'm not going to say if you go if you go skiing in the in the in the uh, in the mountains, you don't sense a, a, a sense of oneness. I'm not going to I'm not going to make that point. Okay. You could also feel it on the dry land, but with the water, it's clear. With the water, it's 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 almost it's almost um, it's almost you sense it more. But I'm not going to say it's exclusive to water. I agree with you. Thank you, Rabbi. Yes. Um, when you talked about sensing yourself, which yourself, which yourself you're talking about, because sometimes you do feel like even when sensing yourself, you feel connected to the divine source. And maybe that's why we need to sing a song because song is the language of that kind of soul. So uh, when I say sense myself, I don't mean the negative sense. I mean the positive sense. The fact yeah. that I feel myself as a healthy healthy human being, even my soul, my soul is different than your soul. My 10 spirit is different than your 10 spirit. But what do I feel? I feel, I feel, I feel my own existence. I know that I'm, I have to cleave to God. I know that I'm dependent on God. Just like I know that ultimately without the earth, I won't have a tomato, I won't be able to eat. But I, but I certainly sense myself. But now as a spiritual exercise, if I can get to the point where not every day, not a whole day, I can't, I can't, I can go swimming in the sea, but I can't live in the sea. Right? Moshe lives in the sea. Moshe is Minamayim Shitiu. Moshe is here, but he's not really here. Moshe is really a creature of the sea. And that's why Moshe says, I can't speak. I can't communicate. Why? I'm not, I'm not intelligent enough. No, I am. But I'm not focusing on expressing myself. I'm focusing on connecting to my source. But most people, I have to sense myself. That's being on the dry land. But even if I'm on the dry land every day, could I have a moment where I connect? to the perspective of not the soul, but the subconscious soul. That's the big difference here. When I, in a few minutes, I'm gonna to shift to how this is within the person. And it's a difference between the conscious soul and the subconscious soul. And the conscious soul, the way we experience it is also a, a creature of the dry land. But the subconscious soul is a creature of the sea. And therefore, when people are going back to the sense of being submerged within the womb, really, that's really what's happening here. Is when, I, when I can feel that, that's on the subconscious level. And even the desire to lose, to lose the sense of self, we don't, see, we don't feel that as a, as a conscious need, but it's a very strong subconscious need. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think that's, what, that's what the song is for, because sometimes when you hear music, you feel like you, like you are um, transcending and you connect into that part of soul that connects to the divine, especially that's so why- have, This is an unbelievable class because we have the doctor 
talking about giving birth. That's his feel. We have Vicky, the musician, talking about music. And everything is coming together here so beautifully, like a, like a real symphony. So this is amazing. Okay, let's talk about music for a second. And this is an observation that Rabbi Shneir Zalman makes. And I read this many times, and it's very beautiful. And then his grandson, Tzemach Tzedek, takes it a little further and explains it a little bit better. Not better, like, in other words, in other words um, makes it clarifies the metaphor and explains why the metaphor works. So here's what Rabbi Shneir Zalman says. He says there's something unique about music. Everyone knows music touches you, but there's something unique about music. And if you have to classify, how is music different than any other pleasure? So what happens is like this, in general, Pleasure is associated with novelty. If something is new, it gives you more pleasure. If you read a book for the first time, it's enjoyable. You watch a movie for the first time, it's enjoyable. Could you watch an old movie? Okay, you could. It's not as enjoyable as the first time you, you, you write it. And the same thing is you, you watch it. Same thing is with any type of pleasure. If I'm eating a piece of chocolate. I always say the second piece of chocolate is never as tasty as the first, which is why I keep going because I eat the first piece of chocolate. It's so delicious. Then I eat a second one, it's not as good, but I want to recreate the feeling that I have with the first piece of chocolate. So I, so I say the second one didn't do it, let me try the third. The third one, I get even less pleasure. So it's not doing it, so I have to eat the fourth. So you see what I'm saying. The point is, in general, pleasure is with a chidush, with novelty. And something old will not give you as much pleasure as something new, in general, generalizing here. There is an exception, clear exception. And the clear exception is music, because with music, People find something interesting. Again, jet making generalizations, but this is the way it works. When you hear a song for the first time, it's not as enjoyable as the songs you heard many times in the past, right? The songs of your youth, the songs that you already know, the songs you sang, you sang, you sang many times, those are the songs which give you the most pleasure, generally speaking. Um, that's str strange. What happened to the element of novelty, which is critical to the concept of pleasure? So I once told this to somebody, he says, no, 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 I go back. And every now and then I go back to the first books that I, the, uh, uh, first books that I, ever, that I ever read. Every now and then I go back to read it and I really enjoy it. I said, of course, but why are you going back? You're not going back for the idea that they convey because the idea you already know, you're going back to the music of the book. In other words, the, the book has a certain rhythm has a certain music that touches your soul and therefore you're going back to hear it again. But the idea, how many times can I hear the same idea? If you come back Sunday and I tell you the same thing I told you on Friday, you're going to say, I don't understand why I came back. I didn't learn anything new. And if you go into a class, you have to learn something new. But if you go to a concert, you don't have to hear something new. You go to a concert, you hear something old that actually touches you deeper than the new song that they're introducing. I drive, I drive my kids in the carpool and then we have this thing, which music are we going to play? They want to hear the music they're used to. I want to hear the music from my past and my, my youth. They don't know my music. I don't know their, their music. It's not enjoyable. If I don't know the song, it's not enjoyable. Why not? If it's a speech, I don't want to hear a speech I already heard before. I want to hear something new. But music is different. So Rabbi Schneer Zalman says, why does that work? Because music touches a place deeper than, than intelligence. Intelligence and any other pleasure has to be new. But if I'm touching the essence of the soul, it doesn't have to be new. And the music has a way of getting to the soul, to the subconscious level of the soul, and therefore newness is not necessary. That's a beautiful idea, which is why we, we talk about prayer. Some people say, oh, why do I have to pray every day? Every day, the same words. It gets boring. Well, it's boring if you're giving a speech. It's enjoyable if you're singing a song. And therefore the sages refer to the verses of prayer we say it's um, verses of song, because essentially that's what you're doing. If you're singing, it means it's coming from a deeper place within your soul. If you're singing, then all of a sudden it's not boring anymore. Okay, fine. That's what Rabbi Schneer Zalman said, and that was very enjoyable for me to hear. And I like to hear it every year because I like the music of it. Okay. But now Rabbi Schneer Zalman's grandson elaborates on this metaphor and says, okay, let's really understand what's happening here and how does it happen? And he takes us to the next level which is something I just read about this year. So I want to share that in the, la in the, in the last few minutes. So Rabbi Shneir, so Rabbi, Tzadik, Rabbi, Nachamendel, the, Rabbi Shneir Zalman's grandson says as follows. He says, it makes a lot of points here. He says, the song of the sea is joy. And we know that how important joy is in the service of Hashem. But to be joyous, the sea must split. And the fact that Hashem split the sea for us the first time that allows us to tap into the place of joy in our soul. 
and he's going to explain it. And then he quotes a verse from King David. King David says, God transformed the sea to dry land. We will cross the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. So one of the ways of reading that verse, it means we, God split the sea into dry land. That's at the, at the splitting of the Red Sea. Then by Nari Avri Baragel, we cross the Jordan River. And, the, and, and, and Regel on foot is a play because on foot could be, Regel could be foot, but Regel is also the pilgrimage holiday. And he says, um, on the pilgrimage holiday, then we will have rejoice in God. In other words, what we're saying is, how are we happy on the holidays? We're happy every day, but how is it on holidays? Do we get the heightened sense of joy? Because God split the sea. Because God split the sea, therefore we can touch joy. And because we can touch joy, therefore we can experience the holiday. Okay, so what exactly is happening here? So this is, this is how he puts it. And this explains why music does not need to be new, even though all other pleasures need to be new. So what Rabbi, Rabbi Tzanach Tzadik says is very interesting. He says that to be joyous, there has to be thirst. There has to be longing. Someone who does not have the thirst will never be happy. So for example, if you give me a cold cup of water, is this enjoyable? It depends. If I'm thirsty, it's enjoyable. If I'm not thirsty, it's not enjoyable. In fact, I'm saying, this is so boring. Why can't you give me something with taste? Give me some beer, give me some wine, give me some coffee. I want taste because the water itself is totally boring, unless I'm thirsty. It's a fascinating halacha. How the law says as follows. The law says, the Mishnah says, that every time we eat or drink, we have to thank God for the pleasure. And we have all different blessings for, to, to, to each blessing are to, um, is designated for one type of food. So the Mishnah says, if I drink water and I'm not thirsty, I don't have to make a blessing. Why? Even though my body needs water, but there's no pleasure. There's no pleasure, there's no blessing. The Mishnah says, Hashotem mayim litzma'o. If I drink water out of thirst, ah, then you thank God. What does that mean? If I'm not thirsty, there's no pleasure. If I'm not thirsty, then the only way to get pleasure is to give me something new. But if I'm thirsty, I don't need anything new. The glass of water is more enjoyable than a glass of wine if I'm thirsty. And the same thing with everything else we have in life. I go outside, I'm breathing the fresh air. Is that enjoyable? If I thirst for it, if I yearn for it, if I didn't have it, if I had some challenge in, in experiencing the, the air, then it's, there's nothing like fresh air. But if I'm, if, if I'm not thirsting for it at this moment, then I need something exciting because just breathing the air is boring. Then I say I need some stimulation. Okay, so what's happening here? Says the Tzemach Tzedek, your soul is a creature of the sea, certainly the subconscious soul, which means your subconscious soul is always yearning for connection to something greater than itself, to other people, to God. Therefore, your soul, because your soul is always yearning, therefore, it's a little uh, counterintuitive, but because it's always yearning, that's why it's always happy. Because any time it acts upon this yearning, this thirst, it gets pleasure. So if I have a deep yearning to connect you and I pick up the phone and I call you, I feel good. Why? Because my yearning has been quenched a little bit. Now it's going to continue in a moment. As soon as being up the phone, I start missing you already. But it doesn't matter. Every moment of quenching the thirst is joyous. But why is it joyous? This is the big idea. Joy must come in connection to, um, connection to yearning. If I don't yearn, then I'm bored. I'm bored of my relationships. I'm bored of my parents. I'm bored of my children. I'm bored of my career. I'm bored of any, everything. Why? I always need something new. So the conscious mind, because there's no yearning in the conscious mind, the conscious mind, pleasure for the conscious mind means something new. But for the soul, for the soul, pleasure means the fact that I can quench my yearning. And what am I yearning for? Because your soul, your subconscious soul is a creature of the sea. It's looking to transcend. It's looking to connect to something greater than itself. In looking to connect to God, that's every mitzvah, brings immense joy to the subconscious mind. Not to the conscious mind, but to the subconscious mind. Because the conscious mind is oblivious to the thirst. And because the conscious mind is oblivious to the thirst, therefore the conscious mind is oblivious to quenching of the thirst. Boring. But the subconscious mind feels this tremendous amount of joy with the quenching of the thirst 
because it thirsts for this transcendence. So if you want to please your conscious mind, you have to bring it something new. If you want to please your subconscious mind, all you have to do, or your subconscious self, all you have to do is quench the yearning. Now, how do I create joy in my conscious mind? Every day in prayer, when I sing the song of the sea, and on the holidays where I feel it in a heightened way, I can only sing. Sing means sense the continuous joy because I'm sensing the continuous longing. I can only sing when once the sea splits. Because what is the sea split we spent, we spent the last the first half an hour saying? The sea splitting means that this, the, the creatures, that the perspective of the sea is accessible to the person on dry, the person in dry land. I go into the sea in dry land. I, the way I exist, I can sense the feeling of the creature of the sea. In other words, my conscious mind can feel a little bit of the perspective of my subconscious mind. If I can split my sea, I could sing. If I could split my sea, I'm joyous. Because if I could split my sea means I get in touch with that yearning to connect to something greater than self. And if I do, that yearning is continuous. And because that yearning is continuous, then the, actually that yearning brings about perpetual and continuous joy because I'm always thirsty. If I am always thirsty, then water is always enjoyable. I don't need a new flavor of water every day if I'm thirsty. Problem is conscious mind is oblivious to the thirst. So the splitting of the sea is allowing the conscious mind to feel some of that yearning of the soul. That's the splitting of the sea. And once your sea splits, then you could be joyous. And once you're joyous, now you can celebrate the holiday. So this is the new edition that I read this year for the first time. I bought the book every, uh, um, a Hey Tavis, we got a Hey Tavis a month, about a month ago, a month and a half ago was the Chabad holiday for the books. It's another topic. This year it came in the mail. I read Hatayra, the book of Ratzam Atzadik's grandson. I opened it up in this parsha. I got these words, unbelievable, unbelievable, very sweet. And again, the sweetness is tied into the yearning and the soul is always yearning. But I don't always sense the yearning. If I'm oblivious to the yearning of the soul, I'll be oblivious to the joy of the soul. And the soul is perpetually yearning and therefore perpetually joyous because the more, because if the yearning is felt, then the water that quenches it, the thirst, even momentarily, but that quenches the thirst, that water is always enjoyable. So every time I connect to you or every time I connect to God, that's a tremendous joy to my soul. Do I feel that soul? Only if I split my seat. How do I split my seat? Every morning. I connect, I mention the splitting of the sea. I mention the soul of the sea to remind myself of the part of self that may be in the subconscious, but it's very much there. And I have to tear the boundary between the subconscious mind and the conscious mind to sense the yearning. And if you sense the yearning, you will sense the joy because that's the perpetual dance of the soul between the yearning and the joy. And uh, that is a story in short. So thank you for joining and um, have a wonderful Shabbos. I just want to say that the Hasidim and the Kabbalists, Shabbos is a day they sing all day. Even the Arizal, which is before Hasidic movement, wrote a song to, to, to connect, to sing at every meal of the Shabbat. So Shabbat is very much associated with the joy. Why? Because Shabbat is the splitting of the sea. If you do the math, the sea split seven days after they left, 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 left Egypt. And so seventh day represents Shabbat. Shabbat is the time where we have physical time, we have more time on the clock, but it's also the state of mind. Shabbat is the state of mind where we get, where we connect to the subconscious soul. And therefore that's the idea of music, as, as we explained, because music is touching that yearning of the soul. And therefore music, you'll never get tired or tired of music. Because what music does, it scratches the surface of the conscious mind and gets you to the place where you're always yearning. If you're always yearning, you'll always enjoy the music. You'll always have pleasure because where yearning is, joyous and pleasurous. So that's the story in short, especially on Shabbat. Get in touch with the yearning, split the sea, and you'll sense the joy. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank Shabbat you. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.